it's really hard right now because I just get so scared to even open my apartment door and leave my house. I haven't been able to work and I don't know if, you know, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be okay. Social isolation is a huge problem for many of the families that we're working with, especially families who are already struggling. We're dealing with a population that sometimes feels like there's no help available to them or that they're out there and they're by themselves. Court is basically canceled for everything but dire emergencies. There are no visits between parents and their children. If parents are expecting to have a child returned, reunified with them, it's not going to happen. It's really hard trying to speak to lawyers and caseworkers just to get a communication system open on what's going on with the case. There's also kids that they're homeless right now, you know, because they don't have that connection to their foster parents. Or they leave home because they're being abused. So the situation that's happening now is extremely important that the youth understand and they know without a doubt that CASA will always have their back and that we're always going to be there. In normal circumstances, CASA is appointed to the cases of children in foster care when judges are concerned that the child is not getting their needs met by the foster care system. We get assigned to these families to help advocate for them and protect them. And as the COVID-19 crisis started to really unfold, our team began figuring out how we were going to pivot to virtual advocacy. The epicenter is now clearly New York. And by tonight, New York State's 19 million residents will be under a stay-at-home order. Even with everything that has been going on, we're still able to get things done because the youth still need the services. They still need the help. They still need the resources. We've been helping families access emergency grants, apply for unemployment and SNAP benefits, helping kids who are in school get laptops and internet access so they can do their online schooling, and making sure that kids who've been kicked out of foster homes or college dorms have safe places to live. And then there's just staying in touch. How are you? Good in yourself. My CASA worker, she reaches out to me just to see how I'm doing, just to see how my baby's doing. That means a lot. The CASA workers, they're doing what they always do. They call us, they, they text us, they check in with us. That necessary advocacy piece has not gone away. If anything, it's just become more important because whether that's substance abuse treatment, mental health, stable housing, these systems that were already hard to access have become that much more difficult in a very short period of time. COVID doesn't stop any progress. It might slow it down a little bit, but it's not stopping anything. We're still picking up the phone. We're still getting on the computer. Conference calls, emails, texts, Skype, you know, smoke signals, horse and pony, pigeon, carrier pigeon, whatever I have to do to get in touch with somebody, I'm going to do. This is the job. This is the job. What CASA is about is finding creative solutions for families to have their needs met and have their kids' needs met. That support that we need because nobody's showing up like that. Nobody's there like that. I never had that type of care before having a CASA volunteer. It's like having a family for the first time, having someone that actually cares about you. I think that's what matters to us the most. Like, you guys show up and you don't have to show up. So it's just, it's, it makes you sentimental because you, you don't have people that genuinely care like that in your life every day, you know? Welcome to the hashtag CASA COVID Fall Speaker Series hosted by the CASA NYC Associate Board. My name is Sadra Battersby Quintanilla, and I am the Associate Board Chair. We are made up of 40 young professionals who raise awareness and funding for CASA NYC's mission. As you may know, CASA NYC is a nonprofit volunteer based organization founded 40 years ago. Our staff and volunteers advocate for the rights and needs of children and youth in foster care. We work to ensure that children and youth transition into safe and permanent homes and that older youth have the resources that they need to live independently. 
Last year, 250 volunteers and a small professional staff served nearly 1,300 children and youth in foster care. Your presence tonight means so much to the Associate Board and to CASA NYC. We sincerely hope you enjoyed tonight's program. And with that, I would like to introduce our benefit chair, Carmen Napier, who has been working tirelessly the last few months to put this series together. Thank you so much, Carmen, and thanks to all of you for your support. Thank you, Sadra. The Associate Board is committed to CASA NYC's mission. And to continue to support the organization, we pivoted our annual summer event to a virtual educational series. The series is composed of five sessions featuring expert speakers in timely topics impacting children in foster care. As part of this series, we are delighted to offer a special online auction featuring nearly 20 curated items and experiences. We add new items each week and will announce winners throughout the remainder of our hashtag CasaCovid speaker series. We encourage you to take a look at the auction when you get a chance and consider bidding on one of the creative packages available. And of course, please tell your friends. Just a few housekeeping items before we begin. Your video and microphones are enabled. We encourage you to turn your video on, but ask that you mute yourself during the presentation so as not to cause disturbances. This discussion is interactive and there will be times at which you may unmute yourself to speak. We also encourage you to make use of our chat and Q&A boxes throughout tonight's presentation. On behalf of the Associate Board, I am delighted to begin our presentation for session three of the hashtag CASA COVID speaker series, Structural Racism in Child Welfare, presented by Dr. Ovita Williams. Tonight, we will discuss the role and impact of racial inequities and implicit bias on children and families involved in the child welfare system. We will close the session with a message from Carrie Moles, CASA NYC's Executive Director, who will speak to us about CASA's work towards racial justice. Our guest speaker, Dr. Williams, will lead us through a very engaging discussion. Dr. Williams is the Associate Director of Field Education for Family, Youth, and Children's Services and an adjunct lecturer at Columbia School of Social Work. In addition to being an educator, she has served as the Director of Clinical Services in the Counseling Services Unit at the Kings County District Attorney's Office and worked as a therapist at the Children's Aid Society. She has a long record of research and development of programs and curricula dealing with structural racism. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ovita Williams. There we go. Hello, everyone, and good evening. Let me make sure everything is on. Thank you so much for that introduction, and thank you for the invite to uh, speak tonight to all of you. Um, and I definitely, we do have some time at the end. Uh, feel free to put some questions. I probably won't get to them till the end in the chat box. But I really want to um, express my uh, deepest gratitude to, to Kui and Carrie for asking me to come tonight and share with you all a look into how racial disparities play out in child welfare and where we are and really have um, an understanding of how racism um, affects families and communities that we work with. So that's a little bit of an overview of what will be, what I'll be talking about this evening. Um, I actually gave this presentation a few months ago and Kerry was there and, and asked me to come and speak with you all. Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, I am, um, a, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. I identify as Afro-Caribbean. Um, my parents immigrated here from Guyana, South America, uh, and that story is the story of many families. Um, and they came to this country uh, to give a better life for me, to get an education, to grow, to develop. And that's what I've been able to do. And along the way, 
Um, there were many lessons learned. Um, I am currently the executive director of the Columbia University Action Lab for Social Justice, where we are committed to working uh, on actionable items around structural racism and action around how social work uh, can be more responsive. Um, as you all know, this has been a very um, upsetting summer in many different ways between COVID, racial um, incidents, police brutality. It definitely has been a very busy time where people are now so very focused on anti-racist work. Um, and the fact that we're having this dialogue tonight really, really speaks to that. There is renewed interest, if you will, um, where people are definitely asking the question, what can we do? Where do we go from here? How can we address racism within the various institutions and structures that we um, live and work in? So tonight is really about how racism shows, out and shows up in the um, child welfare system. Um, I also spent a number of years in the criminal legal system, so working in forensic social work and seeing how racism played out. Uh, many of you may have read um, uh, uh, Mass uh, Incarceration, the New Jim Crow um, by Michelle Alexander, which really spells out the criminal legal system in response to um, how racism impacts people we talk about and work with. So I think we can start the slides. Um, thank you, Takui. So bear with us as I am not, uh, Takui's being so helpful. So tonight I really want to develop a framework for understanding how racism and oppression um, really work within the child welfare system to uh, impact families differentially. Um, and then talk a little bit about the push to end family regulation. Family regulation is actually a term I just came across. A few of my students doing the social justice work um, and really I'll talk more about what that even means, but really the bottom line is the activism around the child welfare system really being a place where families' lives are literally regulated by systems um, and controlled. And so there is a push to uh, end the child welfare system, abolish the child welfare system. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then talk about anti-racism and, and what that means, what that looks like, uh, and justice-based frameworks that we want to really take a look at. Well, if we talk about abolishing the child welfare system, well, then what's the alternative people will then ask? What about the safety of children, right? So really looking at frameworks that can be used to decolonize child welfare and really identifying strategies around problem solving um, and resolution to address challenges that are embedded within um, these oppressive forces. So that's sort of an overview. It's a lot. I have to tell you that these kinds of conversations I usually have over a semester long course. Uh, so to do this in, you know, 45 minutes or whatever time we have um, is actually, um, you know, really challenging to do, but we're going to give it a try. We're going to give it a try. Um, my work at Columbia University School of Social Work involves um, uh, really having social workers understand uh, the concept of anti-Black racism and white supremacy culture and how it shows up in practice and how then to, um, you know, really practice from a lens that's really focused on justice on justice for all, on equity, on liberation. Um, so tonight I'll give a bit of an overview of all of that. Uh, the next slide, please. So as we start, when we talk about race, um, there's a lot of discomfort. You know, people aren't sure what to say, um, how to say, 
their feelings, emotions that come up. Nothing has taught us how to talk about race in this country. And so I wanted to start as I usually do um, without the advantage of having everyone in the room together. If you could each do a bit of self-reflection and tune into how are you showing up tonight? Why are you showing up tonight? Um, and really look at some thoughtful questions, some mindful questions that I have here for you all to consider. Um, and we don't have to talk about it right now, but we could talk about it a little bit at the end. Um, but often when we, we lean into this, these, these conversations around race, um, um, it really brings, brings up a lot. And so it's really about self-reflection and self-awareness. So asking yourself, why are you involved with CASA? Right? What motivated you to be involved with CASA NYC? And then thinking about, well, how might you describe disproportionality? What does that mean for you? What does disproportionality mean for you? And in particular, in child welfare. Um, and then as I started in describing myself as a Black Afro-Caribbean woman, um, what is your racial identity? And how does, how does this matter in the world, right? And then, and in your role with CASA NYC. Because I think when we talk about race, we often talk about race in relation to the other and not really focus in on ourselves and what are our privileges and what's our positionality we are parts of ourselves where we carry privilege. We are parts of ourselves where we experience oppression. Um, so reflecting on that before we even get into talking about um, how racism impacts communities that we serve, it's really about who am I, how I'm showing up, and why do, does that all matter in the way that I see um, the world around me? So. Just take a few minutes and do that, and then we'll move on to the next slide. So if we could move on to the next slide. So child welfare and social equity. Well, I think that's the, that's the bottom line and that's what we're talking about. For years, people have said the child welfare system needs a big overhaul, right? And it's a system that people say has been broken. But when we think about equity and uh, racism and other forms of oppression, the child welfare system probably functions exactly the way that it was meant to function. It's not that it's broken, it's a system that was set up to control, right? And so when we think about that system and think about what equity looks like, it's really about promoting justice and equity. Um, the responsibility of child protection is to address, uh, should be to address disproportionality, racial disparities, who is allowed to keep children, who is not, it's about keeping children and families safe from all harm. So there's a need for improving racial equity in child welfare or abolishing the way that child protection currently operates so that we could move towards equity. But I think that it is worth it to think about how policies, programming, designs, funding, and advocacy needs to completely be reshaped because even if we are able to fix some of the dents and holes and cracks in the child welfare system, inevitably um, some families are impacted differentially than other families. Um, and that's, I think, the bottom line of what we have to really understand and really get to for there to be equity. Um, and I haven't quite decided on abolishing the child welfare system because there is the keeping kids safe. But what I'm very clear about is that um, whatever we have is really disproportionate, disproportionately impacting some children different than other children. And that is 
essentially a big, big issue that we need to deal with. We can go to the next slide. So what does racial disparity look like in the child welfare system? There is an overrepresentation of children of color in child welfare. And then in a few more slides, I'll show you a, a, a figure, a grid. Race, not poverty, remain top predictor of removal. So when you think about children being removed uh, from their homes into foster care, studies show that race, not poverty, and some pe people conflate the two, People conflate race and class, um, and it isn't an, an, an exact conflation, if you will. Um, race and poverty are separate. Racial and ethnic disproportionality is rampant in referrals, screenings, investigations, removals, reunification, and access to services. All right, so when you look at all of the different entry points, the different services, the different uh, activities involved in the foster care system, child welfare system, from the moment there is a screening um, of potential child abuse, you see the disproportionality at that level. Investigations when um, there is uh, work that's being done to assess what's happening at home, what the level of abuse is to make those decisions, this disproportionality at that stage, the high number of um, black and brown kids that are removed, the low number of reunifications of black and brown kids with their families, and then the access to services and referrals. So we see the disproportionality disparities at every step of the, of the game. Black infants are represented at a substantial percentage of infants reported for alleged maltreatment. Um, and African-American children enter at higher rate and leave at a slower weight rate. Next slide, please. Thank you. So what do we mean by institutional and structural racism? Um, and we, we're hearing a lot of those terms over the last several months. Um, and, you know, I think it's an interesting um, conversation that people are having um, in trying to understand how does racism work? Well, there is the micro level, there's the one on one level, there is I experience racism um, as a person of color, a microaggression from someone. And then um, there is the uh, level that's more community-wide, and then there's the institutionalized racism, right? The way in which racism is literally embedded in policies and practices and the way that decisions are made, that then becomes so blind to us, actually, that it's so inherent in the way that things work that we don't even realize that racism is at play. So the social, economic, educational, and political forces are policies that operate to foster discriminatory outcomes or give preferences to members of one group over others. So here are some examples, um, and I bet we can talk about many others. When we think about actual um, policies, written laws that were put in place to perpetuate a structure that says some people will get preferences and others won't. And when you look at some of these policies, it is clearly across racial lines, right? You think of redlining, our drug laws, voter suppression, right? We see how it's playing out across the country, um, in particularly communities of color, where suppressing that vote has dire implications for then what happens in our country and in um, city and state jurisdictions. Stop and frisk. Um, a lot of fighting to get to, to really look at stop and frisk and we are 
somewhat past that, but it's still very much, it was a very dangerous policy that was put in place that impacted particularly communities of color. School admissions criteria, no voting rights for individuals formally incarcerated, right? That has very, very important, significant ramifications that not all citizens are allowed to vote. Uh, lending practices targeting economically disadvantaged folks, elderly, people of color, mass incarceration, educational segregation. So we could think of many different ways that, um, that, that racism has been uh, a marker, if you will, with how um, policies were created and developed. Um, so race, which is a social construct, construct, is used to determine access to or denial of privileges, power, and wealth. Next slide, please. So this, um, this chart that I have, a colleague of mine shared with me, really points to the disproportionality of uh, children of color, uh, color um, who walk through the New York City child welfare system. Um, if you look at the child population total in New York City, 26% um, African American, just total child population. But then when you look at substantiated reports, when you look at preventive case openings, when you look at children placed in foster care, children in foster care, African-American children make up a very large percentage, but only make up 26% of the child population, right? The same for Hispanic children. And substantially lower for white and Asian children. So this is a really powerful tool um, to really think about that, to really think about, well, what does, this, what does this mean for practice? What does this mean for the way that our criminal uh, legal system work, our family court system works? If we're not aware that there is, there's gotta be some kind of rationale here if a small number, total population, but overrepresented, if you will, in the child welfare system along all of the um, categories that you see on the bottom of this barcode. Next slide, please. Right. So this is just spelling out what we were just looking at. Um, 14% 14, 14 of the US population under 18 are black, but 23% of foster care in the foster care population. Um, and Detlaf actually, uh, the person who um, wrote this article is in Texas, and I think University of Texas, and they are doing a tremendous amount of work in, at University of Texas on abolishing the child welfare system and really promoting that the direction we need to go in is not fixing, not, um, uh, you know, but really turning child welfare system on its head. Um, so we talked about most of this where the decision making process systemic racism denies access to resources for kinship care. Um, children of color are more likely labeled as maltreated by child welfare caseworkers and placed in foster care, even though no difference in rates of maltreatment by race of family. Next slide, please. So what are these concepts that I you know, keep talking about? Racism, what, what does this all mean? What does this all look like? So <clears throat> racism, socially constructed, uh, race is socially constructed, it's not biological. But racism is very real, right? Um, this system of oppression that really violates a targeted group, um, both overt 
unconscious attitudes. It's a system of advantage based on race and institutionalized through social, political policies and practices. Um, I often like to say that racism is an accumulation of power. So someone has power. And when we think about racism, uh, there is power that white privilege carries. There's privilege. Then there is experiences of oppression. And then there's those structural limitations that we talked about, right? Um, so often people say, well, you know, um, sometimes white folks will say, you know, I have experienced racism, right? And maybe experience prejudice across a racial identity. But when we look at racism, it means someone's in power, someone's carrying the wealth, someone's carrying the economic stability, someone's carrying decisions that are made, and someone's making decisions about how systems operate. Um, and when we think about racism in this country, um, it really is centered on white supremacy. Anti-Black racism, which is the way that we're supporting social work students in understanding um, that in particular anti-Black racism, and we're hearing a lot about that in the last several months as well, is the attitudes and perceptions that have literally fostered white negative judgments about Blacks and Black culture. And then people often say, well, if we just talk about anti-Black racism, we're not talking about racism, racism that happens among all communities of color. And the way to think about it is that anything that doesn't fit with what it means to be white in our society gets moved across this spectrum. If you think about a spectrum of what it means to be white in our culture and what it means to be black, if you're not what it means to be white, which is cisgender, male, English as a first language, um, uh, heterosexual, um, rich, um, citizenship status, um, able-bodied, I can go on and on and on. We know what privilege looks like, right? So on this side is privilege. As you move along this spectrum, and don't fit into that, that category, if you will, you are literally positioned in a place of anti-Blackness, right? So if you think about all identities that we hold, all identities that we carry, where we carry privilege and where we don't, where do we fit on that spectrum? Um, and it's a, it, you know, I think before everything that occurred this summer, um, uh, the level of, of, of ongoing police brutality and murders of black bodies, people had a hard time with anti-black racism and really looking at that as that's where we really need to understand that inherently, inherently in our society, there is something wrong with being black. And that kind of attitude builds a perception that sort of lives and breathes in so much and everything that we that we do. Um, and you know, when my my students that at Columbia, we were developing this course that students all mandated to to, to to take. They said, you know what? It's not just racism; it's anti-black racism. There's something inherently that happens in our society that 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 is a clear message. Um, about uh, where privilege will lie and where privilege won't lie. And I was like, okay. And even a person of color myself really thinking about, well, how is that gonna land? So I imagine that maybe some folks have heard, you know, about anti-black racism or doing work in, in, in this, but it definitely is a moment now where I think people are realizing more, um, which is, I have very conflicting emotions about, right? This is not the first time that we've been here with racism. This is not the first time we've been here with protesting. This is not the first time that we, or the last time, um, that we're going to be in this place. Um, but the fact that we're here and having this is just really important. Next slide, please.
Um, so really some other concepts and words that have been thrown around, um, uh, you know, white supremacy, all that it means to be white gets reiterated and accepted as normal, a racial ideology that privileges white history and assumes white superiority. Um, and if I were to ask in the various uh, entities that, that all of you work in, <clears throat> where do you see, where do you see, or how do you see this um, culture of what whiteness is and uh, play out? Right. So a, a couple of things that are really inherent in white supremacy culture are things like, um, uh, you know, perfectionism. Right. So that everything has to be done a certain way. And that's the only way that it should be. Um, uh, another, uh, uh, con another way of thinking about white supremacy culture is in valuing um, uh, quantity over quality, right? So numbers over people's stories, people's livelihood. Um, and if you have a, a chance, you can Google um, white supremacy culture and look for an article by Akun, uh, O-K-U-N, which really spells out some of those core inherent ways that, you know, whiteness gets perpetuated in systems and places that we work in. And the task is to undo that, to really examine, take a look, and undo the way in which um, uh, privileging white history and white superiority plays out. Um, privilege, it's a word we hear all the time. Privilege is unearned exclusive advantage or benefits based on group identity or status and nothing else, right? That those privileges that uh, we get in our in our privileged identity are completely because of that identity. Um, inter internalized oppression or subordination, accepting, believing the stereotypes about one's own subjugated group, internalizing the system as fixed and inevitable. Internalized dominance, perpetuating the dominant norms, feelings of superiority, denial, guilt, projection, and fear. Um, implicit bias. I, I personally think that um, implicit bias is something that we might overuse a little much um, because I think that it doesn't um, lend us to really be able to center uh, racism, anti-Black racism, white supremacy. It sort of says that there are these blind spots that we have and then we need to um, uh, be aware of those blind spots and uh, do better, which is fine, but it doesn't give us a deeper analysis, right? It just says, this is just how we think. But we think that way because some messages that we've received um, have told us something. We've been socialized in a way to think some way about, about particular groups or particular communities. We, we've, we've learned that. And that, that then moves towards how we then act, right? Uh, so the, the, when we think about implicit bias, um, it is really understanding inherently, how did we come to have those thoughts, those beliefs, those awareness, the awarenesses that really is um, uh, problematic? And how do we undo that? And then positionality, we talk about uh, a lot, a lot of people are using positionality. And what is that? That's really, where am I positioned in society across my different Id identities? How, do, how does my race intersect, intersect with my gender? Um, how does my gender, race, and sexual orientation, and age, how do those identities fit in the way that I'm viewed and positioned in society? Do I carry privilege? Do I not? How am I treated? How do I receive resources? How do I not? Depending on how society has labeled those different identities as worthy and deserving and not so. We'll go to the next slide. Thank you. So let's just give this some context. Um, 
the community districts with the most child welfare placements are also communities with the largest percentage of families of color and experiencing high levels of poverty. So how does poverty and racism impact um, untapped communities, communities that um, are, 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 are very much active and um, filled with lots of, 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 of um, opportunity, but really um, negatively portrayed. I use untapped because I think language is so important. Rather than saying marginalized or under-resourced, which gives a very negative connotation, it's like our communities are very much um, resourceful and we often don't sort of tap into to what that is. So how does poverty and racism impact um, communities that we work with? Well, we look at um, high rates of unemployment, high infant mortality, high rates of incarceration, low high school grade, failing schools, inadequate housing, increased rents, you know, low wage jobs. Um, you know, these are, uh, you know, ways that we have to really take all of this into consideration that families that are, that are impacted on so many different levels. Next slide, please. So what are these social um, inequalities that um, really, really, really need context around? Because in, in child welfare, people aren't showing up only because they've, there's some kind of abuse that we have to put the experience of the, of the family that we're working with in the context of what other structural issues are in place that really lend itself to um, families needing way more, right? So inadequate housing, looking at our education, inequality, inequity in our educational system, uh, policing in communities of color, stigma, uh, around mental illness, um, thinking about families that are, are living in places where they have to travel hours for supportive intervention programs, inadequate childcare options, that there are these structural issues that are in place that directly impact how families are able to care for their children, provide for their children, and have access to um, resources. Loss of in income, because of child welfare cases, having to come to court regularly, not being able to work. Um, survivors of intimate partner violence, work that I did for a long time, may lose jobs or housing, then punished for not having adequate housing or seeking shelter by children being removed, right? So it's really thinking about, well, what is the, what is the, the way that we can build uh, a larger uh, perspective, a larger story to be told um, uh, when we are thinking about how we're going to provide services for families that come through the child welfare system. It's not just the child, the caregiver, an abusive incident. It is how, does this, how is this family situated in all of the ways that other systems and other um, uh, you know, realities may be impacting that person's life, that family's life, all right? Uh, next slide, please. So where do we fall? What's the result? Families facing inadequate resources are then facing punitive responses by the child welfare system. And I think that's important to sort of sit with. You know, when there are these inequities, when there are systems that um, have really failed families, um, then it's, it's, it becomes harder, it becomes more of a challenge. Um, and then families are then um, negatively impacted um, by having these punitive responses, children being removed, um, again, family regulation. We think about preventive services, your child, you must come to counseling, you must do X, Y, and Z, you must fill these objectives um, or else you're going to lose your child. Families are separated and regulated, right? So the root is really looking at um, how all of these systems impact families that we work with. 
and not sort of just sitting in uh, fixing the immediate problem, but really stretching it out more. Next slide, please. And, and you know, I think many of us may realize this, that, that's, that, that, that separation, the impact of having child, child welfare system um, in your life, all of this is what is really can happen for folks. You know, broken families, um, increased surveillance, um, negative educational outcomes, um, and continued negative stereotyping and narratives about black and brown parents and caregivers as not being able to care for their children. So if we don't look at those, the larger picture, look at the social inequities, look at how um, various forms of oppression impact folks, then our narrative becomes very narrow. It very much becomes there's something wrong with parents who cannot take care of their children, right? But we have to situate people um, in a much larger frame in order to understand what that web is, if you will, that continues to play havoc on a parent's ability to provide, to uh, care for, um, <clears throat> and to really be as present as possible when there are all of these other sorts of um, forces that really are what folks are dealing with. Um, Dr. Kenneth Hardy, who's a psychologist, um, writes about racial trauma and the racial wounds that um, he was writing particularly about youth, black youth, um, who were talking about the pain that no one seems to address, you know, the pain around um, ha being heavily sur sur surveyed by the police by having teachers that um, don't listen, put them down, put, you know, um, policing in the schools, you know, their guards in schools. So that those wounds, that trauma um, is directly impacting and can directly impact um, parents who are experiencing racism in all of these systems that they are impacting. And that really sits in the body, it really sits in the soul, it really sits in the mind. And our task as, as, as workers, as um, social worker, is really to listen and really to center those stories and those narratives um, because it builds a bigger picture. It builds a bigger picture beyond what's written in the case file, what's written in the judge's file, what's written um, in the court papers. It builds a bigger picture if we really are able to sit with how folks are experiencing um, systems of uh, racism and other forms of oppression um, in all that they are and all that they do and, and where they have access. Next one, please. Thank you. So what does social justice look like in, you know, just in general, but really attaching it to what would justice look like in the child welfare um, structure? Well, social justice is beyond diversity. Often we think about if we train people around diversity and cultural competence and how to think about multiculturalism, which often looks like um, we're going to train folks in I'm sure many folks have attended different cultural competency kinds of workshops. Um, it really focuses on thinking about how different people respond or act, how communities, how different cultures, um, um, you know, respond. And so that's, that's old, old school, as I say. We're not using cultural competency anymore. We're not using multiculturalism anymore. It's really about raising our racial awareness so the more aware we are, then the more sensitive we become, right? And social justice includes um, not just diversity, um, but equity, inclusion, liberation, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about liberation, and decolonization, right? 
So equity is beyond equality. Equality is when everyone has the same thing and it should be fine because then everyone's getting the same resources, the exact same resources. Equity takes into account that, yeah, and there were all, some folks, because of the way that oppression works, um, still won't have the same because those systems will continue to impact that person, right? So equity means um, taking it to a whole another level. It really means that, yes, everyone has access to um, the same resources, and we need to think about the fact that um, other forms of oppression are alive and well, and we need to address those issues as well. Inclusion liberation, which I'll talk about, and decolonization, right? And then issues of power and privilege. Next slide, please. So what is liberation practice model? And I share this because it definitely has um, been uh, a way to think about that we need to move beyond just thinking about uh, equity, as I said, but really liberating, right? The awareness of the greater social, political, and institutional forces impacting people's lives, right? That we need to understand our own positionality and how it shows up in practice. And joining with communities we serve towards liberation from opp oppressive stru structures, right? So in the work that we do in our various lives. It's not that we are saving people and moving in and fixing people's, what people are experiencing. It's really asking the community, what is it that you need? What is it that you have as resources? What is it that I can walk side by side with you on this journey to support, right? What it is that needs to happen, right? And it's again taking it outside of the immediate, the, the immediate person and having conversations that look like what are the other social issues, political issues, and institutionalized forces that are at play. Next slide. I think I have a diagram on the next slide that really points out a little bit of an example if we can see this. So, you know. Usually when we're working with, in this case, children um, or anyone, we start with the personal, right? We have this diagnosis that we attach. We have, um, you know, an assessment that includes demographics. Who's this person? Here, there's this, you know, presenting issues. This young person is arguing at home, right? But if we take a look at the institutional impact, and the cultural impact, we get a bigger picture, right? So this is a young person, age nine, male, African-American, diagnosis, ADHD, living in low income housing, uh, family history of intergenerational poverty, difficulty in obtaining work. And usually we stay right there. Usually we stay in that place and while we have a picture of lots of problems, lots of, um, uh, you know, things that are going on that we need to somehow, you know, we need to fix all of that and we leave it on something is wrong with this young person, something's wrong with the family, and we leave it there. But if we were to expand ourselves to think about, well, what are the institutional kinds of things that are happening in the way that this young person is experiencing um, whatever is going on? You know, so institutionally, you have an unsympathetic and hostile um, staff, underfunded school systems, inadequate training in special ed, medicalized mental health systems that ignore social context, capitalist economic system that deprioritizes family, leading to lower job opportunities for multi-stress families. And I could go on and on and on and on. And then what are the cultural kinds of things that might be going on? You know, 
a system that might be parent blaming. Um, uh, uh, the archetypes that people have about young African American men, um, this idea of individualism and pulling oneself by one's up by one's bootstrap. If that is a way that I'm a, a worker coming in and working with this young person and thinking that way, then I'm already creating a, a barrier or a disadvantage. Sharing of families who utilize social welfare agencies. So now I can hold, now I can hold the myriad of, um, uh, you know, forces that um, are playing a part in this young person and this young person's life, right? And I can look at my interventions through this lens of this, this liberation health model, if you will, through this lens, not only as the worker or the provider, service provider, but also partnering with, and that's the thing about liberation health, it's partnering with the family, with the individual to understand how these systems may be playing a part in their own lives, right? And to sort of see that it isn't me and I'm not the problem, it is also all of the ways that all of these other factors play a part in what um, is going on and what I'm experiencing. Uh, and that's a huge shift, I think, for, for many of us, from, you know, for many of us, is really taking it outside of the person and really being able to see that that's not the only place, right? And not to stop there. Next slide, please. Thank you. So what is happening now in terms of how people are thinking about um, what should happen with our child welfare system? Um, a lot of work around and, and, and activity and activism around um, the system that is regulating the way families um, are, um, are, are, are treated. So child welfare used to punish and regulate families. So ending child welfare, some say. Next slide, please. And I'm, I'm seeing a lot of not even using child welfare in the activism world, but really using the terminology uh, in describing the child welfare system as um, a family regulatory system, uh, which I think is powerful. And we can have some discussion about what people think or feel about that. So how do we create an anti-racist child welfare system? Um, well, get rid of it, right? But then the next question is, well, what about, you know, the safety of children? Um, so what would this look like? Put an end to separating children from families. Eradicate raci racism, not the black family. Replace the current system while still keep keeping children safe. Um, families and communities require preventive resources right? Not separating. Um, and I, you know, I want to hold the fact that, I really want to hold the fact that um, child abuse is, 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 we all know this, we're in this work because child abuse is, is it happens, it's real. No one's saying that that isn't the case. What's being said is that the disparities at play are dangerous. The disproportionality is dangerous. And we really need to pay attention and be cautious and be mindful of when we say that there is substantiated experiences of violence in the home, who are we saying that about? And how much, how many times are we saying it about um, certain families and not others, right? And I think that's what we have to really be able to sort of dig through. Next slide, please. So, you know, in all of this, it's really creating an environment of dialogue to 
better understand people's experiences, people's experiences of um, microaggressions within the systems that impact um, their lives, um, the experiences of racism that um, people see from the moment a report is made to a worker showing up at someone's house, to coming to court, to coming into a social service agency. Um, so that is really creating an environment where we can talk about how people experience racism um, that occur in all aspects of the child welfare system. And holding these conversations in all spaces, considering each person's positionality, worldview, power, privilege, and social identity. Um, one, of the, one of the uh, things that my, myself and my colleagues have done, and I've actually known CASA for many, many years, and I actually do, used to do um, their volunteer training on how do we even build a space in our, in our organizations, our agencies, about how we even talk about um, race and other parts of our identities. Um, and holding these critical conversations, that's why actually this format is so uncomfortable for me because I like to get into a dialogue, right? And really push us to, um, to, to digest, to understand, to expand, to build on, you know, how we are able to even be in a space together and deal with the discomfort around these conversations. So if we can't do it as service providers in whatever capacity we are, um, then how is it that people who come to us for services um, are able to say that, you know what, this is a place where I can express who I am and what my, what my experiences are. And building the capacity to be aware and sensitive. Next slide, please. Thank you so much, Sakui. <laughs> um, bringing in trainers, completing a strategic plan that includes a commitment to justice, anti-oppression, liberation practice, and again, beyond diversity, changing policies that are marginalizing people, creating steps to tap into resources from all levels and all groups, right? have spaces that people in their identities are welcome in all of who they are and can be at, at any of the organizations and places that we show up. Um, it's about validation. It's about not minimizing. It's about um, recognizing where our blind spots are um, in having a better scope of understanding how uh, racism shows up all across the various systems, um, and then how people are experiencing that. Next slide, please. So there's, I'm not gonna, we don't have to click on this, but I just wanted to upend movement is doing, um, and you probably have heard of them, doing a lot of work around um, re-envisioning the child welfare system and looking at those disparities and looking at um, how racism is inherent um, and really calling actually, you know, taking the stand of really, again, abolishing the child welfare system. So you can always take a look at that and do some research on your own. And I think they have some, some workshops and uh, other activities that you can attend. Next. Um, so with that, um, Carrie and I spoke about how to really um, build space for all of you to have some conversation with each other um, and really think about, well, where is where is CASA NYC in thinking about you know re envisioning the child welfare system, doing anti racist work within the child welfare system? So these are some questions that we wanted to pose um, and really open up if we can some dialogue where you can put into the chat. But really thinking about you know why does this conversation matter for CASA NYC? Why does this, why, do, why, why even have this dialogue? How do you understand current initiatives at CASA 
NYC to upend racism within the child welfare system? And how might you envision child welfare from an anti-racist lens? What would have to happen? What would that look like? Um, so I'd love to hear people's ideas and thoughts. Um, Carrie and Takui, however you want to manage that. And then after we have some of that dialogue, we'll, we'll wrap up. Great. I think we can launch into Carrie's portion and then we'll, we can definitely come back to this. Come back? Mm -hmm. Great. Great. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, Ovita, thank you. This has been amazing. And I would, um, you know, really encourage, I mean, I, I would like to encourage dialogue. I know it's difficult uh, in these Zoom formats. And I I'm happy to talk a little bit about what CASA has, the work CASA has been doing over the last few years in terms of sort of reframing the work that we do um, through a lens of racial equity. But I would love to actually just jump in and see if people have, if anybody either in the chat or wants to unmute yourself and talk a little bit about why this conversation matters for CASA and sort of get to Ovita's question. And I know there are a number of you, uh, we have a number of volunteers, we have a number of staff, we have associate board members, board members. Um, if anybody wants to chime in rather than me, kind of going through the litany of things that we've been, um, our, our efforts so far um, on our journey towards being an anti-racist organization. Um, would love to hear you all jump in about just your perspectives on the initiatives, uh, what we're doing and, and how it's going so far and what your thoughts are. I would like to jump in. Hi, Haas. Hey, everybody. So I'm Haas Williams. Hi, Haas Williams. I am the newest member of staff here at CASA NYC, the Youth Services Coordinator. And in spite of walking into a new realm of professionalism, in spite of a pandemic and onboarding in the midst of it, I would like to say that my presence here at CASA is a uh, proof and manifestation of a the relevance but b the level of dedication and seriousness that i would like to give credit to kerry but i'll say casa nyc um has taken to innovate and move forward in this space um i myself am currently in uh in a position that was previously held by a masters of social work um that meaning that I am receiving a salary that is of that same stature. Um, however, I have done the work and arose to the occasion in some ways of uh, being a credible messenger. I spent 10 plus years in foster care myself. However, uh, from the age of 14 through 22, I spent a lot of time in the entrepreneurial space, um, you know, just growing as a youth leader in advocacy and whatnot. However, I've been met with a lot of like professional, I guess like bureaucratic roadblocks and or equitable challenges due to, um, I guess we could say arbitrary boundary that is born of uh, systemic racism and or inherited uh, circumstance due to a lack of foundational and or circumstantial resources. Um, yet. Carrie saw the value in my experience. She saw the value in my professionalism and efforts as well as passion. And she brought me on board here where I can, you know, be edified and, you know, grow as a professional and even, you know, it, learn and grow my credibility in this, in this atmosphere, not necessarily the industry or even the life or the passion and intentions that go along with it, as I being closest to the issue um, and probably most closest to the solution. But, you know, she granted me the environment and the opportunity to come into this environment and in a space where, you know, I've been denied for various reasons, be it, you know, oh, we, in order to pay you this much, we got, we need this degree or in order to do this, you need this certification those kinds of things um and she's not only welcomed me in but done everything in her power to support me in that growth in that development in that learning and at every turn and every corner 
you know, invest in me in various ways. Um, however, I would like to answer these questions <laughs> um, on, a, on a personal note. So I just want to, I definitely want to lead with highlighting um, what CASA NYC has done and how I, my presence, is a proof to the actual work being done on equity and changing um, the racial relation in this industry, let alone the, the world um, and, and heritage circumstance. So why does this conversation matter to CASA? This conversation matters to CASA because CASA deals with youth that are the former versions of myself. They are transitioning out. They are lost. They are looking for resources and support. They are looking for guidance. They are looking for, you know, uh, someone from the light at the end of the tunnel to come into the tunnel and say, hey, I'll guide you to that light. Um, and so that's necessary. And for those that may be on a call, CASA is, and may not know, CASA is a uh, very... Uh, old organization that has been historically predominantly run by middle-aged white women and <laughs> that uh I guess like that inherited circumstance uh un unintentionally gives a uh, ill perspective to um the the fallacy and or the nature of systemic racism that occurs in this work um how do I understand the current initiatives at CASA to upend racism within the child welfare uh, system? Not only have I been hired and onboarded and supported here at CASA to advance and um, further align myself with my vision of my worth, value, and passions for this work, but also I've been constantly invited into the conversation and welcomed into the train of thought that is the things that I were, or wasn't groomed in or the, the, the circumstances I didn't inherit as far as like being um, groomed in conversations or even trains of thought on how to executively, you know, think about these things and or how to approach these things, be it organization of philanthropy, uh, client to organization, you know, and the various approaches and ways of doing that as well as uh, my innovation and or spirit to the things that I bring to the table that maybe the organization has not um, been mindful of to date, you know, we're always in conversation about how to innovate and create and or incentivize and, you know, uh, move in those directions um, and or make compromises where that's the case. Um, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and how might I env envision child welfare from an anti-racist lens? Um, I think that, uh, Child welfare from an anti-racist lens is going to take account for the individual with the presence of all influence that has contributed to the present moment. Um, and so that's to say that every family, every child, every life may be individual. However, the influences on a macro level may be rather general and or categorically aligned. Um, and thus we can create practices and or devices and techniques that allow us a maneuverability in our day-to-day -day work that lends strength, power, and advocacy to equitable results as well as desirable results for that individual life by taking an individual lens of awareness to that case. Thank you, Haas. That was um, you answered all the questions, so I guess we're done now. Um, no, that was very helpful. And I want to, you know, I want to just say that um, the, the original point that Haas is making, it's important to point out. So we, um, Ovita mentioned that we don't use the term cultural competence anymore, or multiculturalism, right? The, the, the language is consistently shifting appropriately as we learn more. And when we sort of embarked on this journey a few years ago, we were talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that's been the term. And I think we're even shifting away from that a little bit. Um, but it's one of the points that Haas makes is that, you know, so diversity is important, but it's, and we have changed some of our hiring practices and worked really hard. I think thing one is to, you know, one of the first things we needed to do is really explicitly acknowledge 
that we um, that we are a an organization not only operating in a uh, racist society um, and in a system that is based on structural racism, but then that also internally in our own organization, we uh, we operate in the same ways as the rest of the society. And as Haas said, we are uh, we are an over overwhelmingly uh, white female organization. Um, and the efforts to, you know, increase diversity are important, but only so far as we can, uh, diversity is necessary in order to have inclusion, which means including the voices of people who are impacted by the systems. Um, and so um, we've made a couple of different efforts to do that. Obviously, um, we're thrilled to have Hassan because he's somebody who's got lived experience in the system. We have people on our board with lived experience in the system now. Um, but we're also working to, one of the things Haas leads is our Youth Leadership Council. Um, and that's been incredibly important to us because we're able to incorporate the voices of people who've been in foster care um, in really all aspects of our policies and our, our practices and our program decisions. Um, also incorporating the voices of people who have been parents uh, who've had their children in the, involved in the system, who've had their children removed from them. So that uh, inclusion of everybody's voices is another sort of uh, really, really important step along the way to being an anti-racist organization. Um, and I wanna leave time for other people's comments and questions. And Takui, you had a, do you wanna read some of the comments or questions in the chat? That sure. Respond? Definitely. I'd like to acknowledge um, Lisa. She wrote in a comment about her experience. Um, she writes, I'm a former case worker and my clients were disproportionately African American and Latinx. Um, I came to understand that there's a ton of factors that lead to rushing to keep children safe instead of truly, instead of identifying a true harm. Two former cases are stuck in her mind. One is removing an infant from the hospital because her parent tested positive for marijuana. The second is removing an entire family of kids because the mother left one scar that was not a gash on her son's arm. It was heavy, heartbreaking, and I could not accept either of those decisions. Thank you for sharing uh, I mean, thank you for sharing that, you know, and, um, you know, and, 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 and I think the thing about that is that I, I remember a few years ago, someone was, you know, talking about a mother who identifies as black smoking marijuana and having a child removed and a mother who identifies as white in the middle of the opioid crisis and not having a child removed, right? That that is inherently how, how this, this operates. So if we're gonna, you know, or, t or taking, actually I think the example was taking um, uh, uh, sleeping pills. <laughs> And that was privileged over a mother who is, you know, so Lisa, your point is so poignant because we, how, how do we, how do we shift that? How do we change that um, kind of bias? Um, and we have to recognize it first. And we have to, as Carrie's saying, really build a place where we're even saying that that's, that's messed up, but calling it out as racist, right? Calling it out, you know? I wonder if I could jump in because, Ovita, uh, what you said just reminded me in the last two days I've had the opportunity to twice hear a woman. Um, you might know, some of you on the call might know her, Jessica Price. Um, I don't know if that ring, name rings a bell, but she was talking about it. She's a researcher, um, I think, from the SUNY system and was working out of Albany and did an experiment or a pilot program in Nassau County few years ago, where, which they called uh, blind removal, not uh, colorblind, but blind removal. She made a point of differentiating between those two. And she said that um, what they did is uh, they had, uh, I guess, small teams of people who would make decisions in um, if a child would, should be removed from the home. Oh, first of all, let me back up to the statistics you have mentioned that uh, in Nassau, as well as probably in most of the country, the children involved in foster care system were uh, disproportionately people of children of color. 
and they wanted to see what they could do about it. So um, when they um, reviewed a case, the blind parts where they didn't put the name in because often you can tell a person's background from the name. They did not, of course, put race in, nor did they put in the address because they said when they found um, there was a bias in some case managers uh, acknowledged, oh, when they saw a certain zip code or a certain um, uh, uh, housing project, they, they tended to think, oh, this is going to be a, you know, I know what's going on in that case. So anyway, they, they made it as blind the case as possible. And as a result, um, over the last few years or the few years of the study that the percentages of children in foster care were much closer representing their percentage in the general population. It was a huge number and I took, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but just startling like from, you know, 26% of the population to uh, 75%. Yeah. 59%, it was 59% and within a year it was down to like 26%. Yeah, oh, amazing. And and I was thinking of that when you were asking us about our three bullets, and I thought the thir first, the third bullet might be a very practical approach. Um, and then when you just mentioned this case, Avita, of, you know, the substance abuse alleged and so forth. So that's it. Thank you, Barbara. No, thank you, Barbara. Yeah, that's, um, that's good. Yeah. And that's an approach that, you know, can it, can it be on a larger scale? You know, what might that be? But it's, it's, it, it really speaks to what we're talking about, that there is inherent, right, um, attitudes, right, that get perpetuated. And so if you take that out, then you can really sit with, you know, thinking about it, asking the question, is this child in danger or not? Right? Without having to attach it to various social identities, right? This child is in danger because their, their family is X, Y, and Z. So it's re it really kind of boils it down to, is this child in danger or not? And let's start from the core of what the child welfare system is supposed to do, protect children. And also, is the child in danger? And also, because what's now required in the law is to look at not only whether the child's in danger, but the harm of removal, right? So, you know, there's always some exactly. level of risk, but if you're going to harm a child more by removing them than by keeping them, you know, in a situation that might not be, you know, perfect parenting. Um, I, I also wanted to just call out something, Ovita, you spoke about, Barbara, you met, you were talking about the Nassau County um, study, and I thought that was really interesting. And often we use, we, we say people of color. Um, and Ovita was talking about anti-Black racism specifically. And I think it's important to call out the, the fact that, you know, uh, people, it, it, people of color experience discrimination and racism in general, um, and in our city certainly. But in New York City, the disproportionality of children in foster care is Black children. Let's be clear. Um, Hispanic children have higher rates of investigation, but the number of Hispanic children or Latinx children in foster care are proportionate to the population. Um, the number of Asian children and, and other children of color is lower than in proportion to their populations. So it, so it is very explicitly, even though it's not just black children who are living in poverty, right? So also to Ovita's point, about poverty, um, it's it's uh, there is a, a big difference in terms of anti-black racism, and and that's why it's important to center anti-black racism in this conversation, which doesn't minimize the importance of any other form of oppression or marginalization or LGBTQ people who are also at high risk um, and many other groups. But I think that's just important to call out. Hi, Carrie. Um... I was wondering if I could um, also speak to that question of why is this, I don't know if my camera is working, but um, why yes, is this yes. conversation important for CASA? And coming from my perspective from California and my experience with the CPS, Child Protective System uh, Services in California Emergency Unit, as well as the CASA system in California and then to New York, um, what I, 
really wanted to speak to is Avita speaking about family regulation. I feel like sometimes people don't see CASA as a system that also perpetuates family regulation, but definitely CASAs throughout the states perpetuate that um, idea that now we have these, like Ha said, um, why ladies who have become the standard of what uh, the right motherhood morally, you know, is supposed to be teaching, you know, basically these kids that are not of their own culture and, and telling the courts what they should, should not do. And one of the things that kind of ama- made me just really appreciative of, of NYC CASA is for, um, first of all, I want to acknowledge Carrie for being so passionate about this and uh, really um, caring about creating, you know, racial equity and and building it and and seeing that as just a step um, forward. And we talked about how in NYC we don't give recommendations in court. We and we also work with families versus I know that in my experience many CASAs work directly with kids and never really work with bio families. That has been so rare in California, especially. And seeing how we really take that holistic approach of what can we do to help this family, you know, with housing or ICPCs or whatever it is that they need. And because of our structural racism within CASA itself, it's such an important conversation. And I'm so happy to be part of it. Um, And I'm one thing that also really impressed me, um, Carrie, what you have done is the staff research. Having staff actually get in and research systematic uh, uh, racism, uh, structural racism in all these different systems that funnel into child welfare system not only gives you know quality training and education but also it bonds all these staff members together over this um and and kind of creates a sensitivity that now not only it's not like you're just sitting there at training you research this and you have you know you talked about it and you've processed it and i think that would create a very uh sensitive staff to these issues and um, it's, it's like a holistic approach to training. So I'm very excited to see what CASA does and what we come come up with, with the racial equity training. And um, thank you for being here. Thanks Violetta for those comments. And I wanna, um, I would just wanna acknowledge, I mean, I think one of the most important things that we are doing so yes, CASA across the country and in New York City as well, traditionally, our volunteers are primarily white women, um, people of privilege. And so while we are working to increase diversity, we also need to be working in our, and it is our priority to continue to work to make sure that the people who are our volunteers are able to um, you know, do all the things that we just talked about in terms of really understanding. And Ovita, I love your framing of this in terms of liberation practice, because, you know, being an advocate really means walking side by side and helping a person to, you know, recognize the barriers and overcome the barriers that are in front of them, as opposed to telling them what to do, Um, making recommendations to the judge on their behalf, being the voice of other people. Um, So it's important that we um, better prepare the the people who we, who we, who are our volunteers and who are very dedicated um, and very committed. Um, But this is hard work to do. And this isn't work that, you know, we, this is not information that, that we have, um, that many of us have. Um, So I want to turn it back to Ovita because we're running out of time and I want to give you a minute to wrap it up and give us your final Mm -hmm. thoughts. And I know we didn't get to um, every, I want to make one comment. I know we didn't get to everyone's questions, but we will also, um, you know, can also shoot out emails and responses to all those questions. Thank you, Carrie. I mean, this has been a wonderful conversation. Um, When we think about what it means to be an anti-racist organization, you know, many organizations 
end at diver you know start at diversity and end at diversity mm -hmm. right so just increasing the number of people that you have on staff that rep that where there's representation is not the end of it right it's really what you're doing now and what i hear that you, you all are doing it's really digging in and thinking about what does that future vision look like uh in this in in this organization to really look at all forms of of oppression and how it plays out um and really reflecting that everyone has full participation in the decisions that are made power who has power um and that members across all identities are very much involved in shaping the institution right and shaping the organization and it sounds like that's the road on which i think that you are leading to um and so i'm happy to hear that i'm happy to be here tonight i think i have my number and email on a few slides after this um and really enjoyed the conversation and look forward to further dialogue because that's really where it starts is having these kinds of dialogues so i appreciate being here and sharing whatever i could and hopefully it landed uh, in some way for each of you and what you're doing for families that you're working with so thank you Thank you. So thank you again to Dr. Ovita Williams for taking the time. She's an incredibly busy woman and we really, really appreciate your, your time tonight in leading this conversation. Also want to thank our associate board um, and our very own Takui for organizing this. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is the third in a five series, uh, uh, five session series. Um, on issues relevant to children and child welfare. Um, the associate board has worked really hard and done an incredible job and we're very grateful to you. Um, if you missed the first two, you can access those other uh, recordings of those on our websites. And please look out for, um, for the dates for the next two sessions, which will be on the family court system and on the relationships between advocates and youth. Um, and we will send you all the recording. Um, and thank you all for joining us.